So let's see, the clock says 22 after whatever hour this is. Let's start this. All right, so there's chapters on drugs. What can we say about those? If you remember, enzymes do something in the body. Some biochemical reaction. And we talked about if they need a helper, there would be a cofactor, it could be a vitamin, it could be a mineral. And then naturally, hormones turn enzymes off and on. Right side here, 22. Off and on, they turn it off and on. Well, they might they might speed up a reaction, they might stop a reaction, etc. Well, the basics or the basis of drug therapy is to mimic this or mimic the hormone. Hormones ability. So in general, we say that the drugs turn the enzymes off and on for you. And that's a good thing. So right away, classes of drugs. You have pain relievers. And for pain relievers, there's over the counter. To understand this, there's a couple phrases a person has to understand. First, in the body there are endorphins. Technically, they have the same structure almost as a morphine. So the endorphins are for deep pain. These are released naturally to deal with deep pain. If you're saving someone from a burning building or something like that, you might say, gee, I felt no pain, but I ran over all this glass, etc." That would be all the endorphins. Um, you can get endorphin release from exercising. If somebody exercises, they have like their pain goes away in some respects. Then there's another biochemical, I'm still going to deal with the pain relievers. Another biochemical is prostaglandins. And oddly enough, these cause pain messages to go to the brain. And you might wonder why would a person want pain messages to ever go to their brain? If you touch a hot stove, you'd want to pull your hand back from the hot stove. And I think one of the saddest things is children who, uh, it's very rare, but children who don't feel pain, they feel touched, but they don't feel pain. And uh, the parents have to explain to them why they shouldn't hurt themselves. And it's hard with like a five-year-old who could hold you for ransom almost, or hold their parents or blackmail and say, I'm going to hurt myself, I don't feel the pain, and later on in life they know they'd like to keep using their hands and they shouldn't break their fingers off. But when you're young, it's probably quite a challenge. All right, so these over-the-counter pain relievers that we shall cover. The first one is aspirin. made by the Bayer Aspirin Company. He becomes important for a lot of things. So you've got stops or limits, but again, 
information blocks pain and lowers fevers. Some great stuff. Inflammation caused all over your body is uh, quite a problem for people. So if you have less inflammation, even for like your sinus pain, for uh, pain up here from having too much congestion, anything that lowers the inflammation is better. Blocking pain, it's going to block the prostaglandin message. It's going to help you and it's going to lower fevers. What are fevers for again? These are important to fight infection. As the bacteria may not live at a certainly hot, a certain higher temperature, but too high is dangerous. And you want to lower a child's fever. And it's kind of harder to do than you imagine. One of the things with COVID, one of the signs they look for with a fever, so they look for a spike temperature, so people who were trying to get around it would take something to lower the fever, even if uh, they just didn't want to deal with it. They wanted to like be able to travel in another country, so they would look at their temperature and they'd take one of these drugs to lower their fever. Something else it does is an anticoagulant. So this is going to thin your blood. So if you're going to get, um, oh, I suppose you're going to get an operation, they tell you that, you know, we're going to be cutting major parts of your body open and we'd rather your blood not be so thin that we can't stop it from bleeding so you don't want to take an aspirin the day before. But this is good if you have chlorodomides. Clog arteries. So we talked about that when we talked about the idea of a lipoprotein and high density lipoproteins and low density lipoproteins. Well, if you have a clogged artery and you have some plaque build up in here, this doesn't actually get rid of the plaque for you, but if the, the blood is thinner, it's going to be able to travel through. Anytime you have a blockage here, you could have a heart attack, as we said, or you could have a stroke if it's going to the brain, and you don't want that. So uh, that's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. People say it, well, not people say, but it causes stomach bleeding. But I think it's because of the acidity of the aspirin. Um, if you take a buffered aspirin, so if you're taking, um, oh, I would say Alka-Seltzer. They have some really nice preps these days. Alka-Seltzer uh, will stop, will help you with heartburn. You don't want any acid reflux in your throat. But to make a long story short, it's got two aspirins in it. And one would think that having two aspirins would be rough in your stomach, but it's buffered, so it's not going to be so acidic on your body. It's got the carbonate buffer. This is pretty amazing when you mix it with some of the other drugs and you make uh, Alka-Seltzer for colds and fevers. It's got like so many good things uh, to work against problems in your body. So I like aspirin for over the counter. I think a lot of people do too. Then there are others, two others to be careful with that. Then there's acetaminophen. So if aspirin was number one, acetaminophen is going to be number two. And acetaminophen, the brand name is Tylenol. And it's a pretty old drug. People like Tylenol. It's good for blocking pain. And let's see, I also have, it's good for fever. It's great for fever.
It's not going to do anything for swelling, really. But it's a, quite a strong drug, and people love it. There's a problem with it, and the problem one would think about with Tylenol is four grams kills you. Not in a good way. Not that you could be killed in a bad way or a good way, but it's going to be massive pain and liver damage, etc. So, and the liver gets rid of, um, as we know, it gets rid of toxins in your body. Four grams of stuff will kill you. Why is that a problem? If you take extra strength, Tylenol, each pill is 0 0.500 grams. So they would say 500 milligrams strength, and that's quite strong. But if you're taking rid of a pair, you got one gram right there. You could easily, over a course of a day, uh, get to four grams. So you want to limit how much of the stuff you take. People don't realize that it comes in a lot of other preps. So let's say you take an extra strength Tylenol that you take two of them, and now you have a gram of the stuff. And then, for example, if you drink NyQuil, Q-U-I-L, because that's going to have something to help you sleep. It's going to be called uh, uh, Dodecyl succinate or something like that. But it's going to be some uh, sort of an antihistamine. We'll deal with the antihistamines. But it's also got um, 350 milligrams. And they want you, with NyQuil, to take a cup and it's only half the size of a cup, but it's got 350 milligrams, I think, of Tylenol in it. And God forbid you're in so much pain from so much of your life, you have like a whole gram of Tylenol here, and then you pour this to the top, well, now you almost got like two grams of Tylenol in one shot. So the number one uh, thing that people overdose on, they use these in preps with a lot of the narcotics. So you might find yourself getting some sort of a narcotic that also has Tylenol in it. Just be careful because Aspirin, you know, it's going to make your stomach bleed, etc. but not that many people overdose with aspirin, but boy, this thing kills a lot of people. People who actually want to kill themselves, and it's not a great way at all, there's no great way to kill yourself, but if you take a ton of acetaminophen, you got like 24 hours, and then at the end, you're in the worst kind of torture your body could ever be in. So um, it's not something a person would do. Anyway, that's two of them. You got the Tylenol, you got the aspirin, and now we're going to work on the third one, which everybody knows, ibuprofen. I-B-U-P-R-O-P-H-E-N. There's a lot of dog preps and things like that. Um, car prep, there's a lot of drugs that are close to it. But this is the brand name Advil. Nuprin. An Advil is 200 milligrams. Five of these would be one gram because 0.2 of a gram is 200 milligrams. 200 milligrams, and then uh, that's over the counter, right? No question about it. If you're frustrated with a bunch of pain and you say to your doctor, I really, really, really want a prescription for something, for God's sakes, they might give you Motrin. This is prescription. And it looks like a horse pill, people would say, because it's 600 milligrams. So I think the doctors are just basically saying, they're not saying go home and just take three Advils. They're saying go to your pharmacist, you get this giant pill to make you feel like you did something special. It's hard to swallow unless you're really good at swallowing large pills, and you could have just took three of these Advils. But I think they're just, they're annoyed by you or something. They're like, sure, I take this. Um, Anyway, uh, you could really build up a tolerance to the stuff. You probably shouldn't, but I don't think that many people have ever really overdosed on Advil. But boy, you could overdose on acetaminophen, which is pretty rough stuff. So what do you got with ibuprofen? Well, let's see. You block pain. You definitely work on swelling. And I'd say anecdotally, perhaps, uh, that I think it works better than aspirin on swelling. Uh, but then it works on fever, too. 
But I think if people say what really works on fever, they would be thinking acetaminophen. If they're saying, what do I want to do to thin my blood? They'd be thinking of aspirin. If they think about what about swelling? They'd be thinking of probably Advil. Let's say, I mean, how can you be proactive with this? You never want to get to your body's point where you're trying to break a cycle of pain. If you bruise yourself badly and you're going to swell up, be proactive. Take two or three Advils. I'm out. You should take two. That's what they say. But either way, you take the prescription uh, dose of a Motrin, which you shouldn't do. I'm not telling you to do that. But if you took at least two Advils, okay, especially if you haven't had Advils before, people work up a tolerance to the stuff. But if you take at least two Advils before the swelling actually caused that much damage, it's a good idea. If you hurt yourself. Okay. In my opinion, you should be like, you know something, it's going to hurt really bad soon. Let me try to make sure it doesn't hurt that badly. I feel that. I used to think when I was young, like if I hurt my arm, I would say to myself, okay, why am I rubbing my arm? I don't want to do something that's stupid. And I would start rubbing my arm because I'd say, I don't want to be a slave to this like mechanism that has no use in my body. I'm not going to rub my arm when I hurt my arm. When I went to college later, I realized or learned that touch receptors travel up the spine faster than pain reception, okay, or touch a nerve response is going to travel up the spine. And a lot of times if you touch, like if you hurt your leg and you start rubbing your leg, you're sending so many touch signals that you're blocking pain signals. And I was like, you know, my whole life I could have just been rubbing my arm and it would have been good for me. So, uh, or at least giving me less pain. You'd be surprised what you do things. But I was always trying to control myself and make sure that I had control of my body, which probably isn't the best thing. So, what else do you get over the counter? Well, they make a lot of combination pills. For example, Excedrin. This would be probably Tylenol with caffeine. And probably even aspirin. They mix them up. <coughs> I'm looking into which one that is. I know Aniston, the old one, is just caffeine and aspirin. And you're probably wondering why caffeine. I think people just feel more bright and chippy when they're speeded up, and it's a, it's a stimulant. They add speed to a lot of these combination pills, and people seem to think it, it works better for them. Uh, there used to be a powder in the South called Goodies. You could still buy that. All of these drugs were in a powder form from the pharmacist originally, the person we called the chemist. And you would just drink it with water because these things, like aspirin dust, is not going to make a pill. You have to add starch to it, and then you can make a pill out of it. So there's all these preps. You can still go to your store and buy something called Goodies and just swallow it. More and more, they're doing that. All right, now, next class of drugs. That was your over-the-counter pain medicine. It's just so the average consumer knows what they're taking, knows what they're buying. Common cold drugs. So, 200 viruses, or 200 virus types, make the common cold. If you think about what a virus is, you could be attacked by a bacteria. It's a living creature that can reproduce itself. And if you're attacked by a bacteria, you can take an antibiotic to kill it, like a penicillin. And we'll talk about that. But if you're attacked by a virus, well, you have a very simple structure, a protein shell, which has a certain order of amino acids 
So it's got a code, a protein shell, and then it has an enzyme. And if you remember, an enzyme does something, and then it has some genetic material. Now, to make a long story short, this thing cannot reproduce itself. It needs a large host cell. And it can latch on, and it's much smaller. It's probably like this small, okay? But it's got, it latches on, and then it sends in its payload. So it sends in its enzyme, and it sends in its genetic information, DNA or RNA. <coughs> My third lecture today is going to be hard. I'm trying to lecture five hours today. I finally got the room that I wanted. But can you lecture five hours? I don't know. We'll see. Whew. Gotta get the room now. And then what would happen is like you could have some major genetic material that's inside the cell, and this could reprogram the cell to make more of the viruses until the cell ruptures, like AZT. How do we deal with this? Well, your body deals with it. Your body makes antibodies to match the code. And the truth is, your body might make like a hundred million different antibodies trying to match the code of this virus. And at some point when it matches it, it can pull out of your bloodstream. But if this is done more damage by the time the antibodies can build up enough immunity to pull it out of your bloodstream, you could have some real trouble. Okay, so there's always a race like that. Your body makes antibodies to match the code. So, viruses. Let's say you have smallpox or polio. The shell does not mutate. Or not very much. So a vaccine works. Now, what is a vaccine? Well, a vaccine could just be a piece of the shell of the virus. So you put some inactivated virus, you said. Inactivated. Let's think of it as like a piece of the shell. P-I-E-C-E. -E. You've got this piece of the shell that goes into your body with the vaccine. Your body thinks it's an attack, so your body makes all of these antibodies to pull these pieces out, and your body learns that this is a virus. Then if you get attacked with polio or smallpox, your body pulls it out because it has memory cells. It's a deep discussion. It's the basic immunity that the body deals with. Okay? Problem is cold virus mutates too much. It's not that dangerous for us. If you get old enough, everything's dangerous for you. You could die of a cold when you're quite old, but, um, or immunocompromised and all these kind of different things. But the cold virus mutates too much. We never think to make a vaccine for it. Because the minute we make a vaccine, it's going to mutate to chain the shell, and we're not going to be able to catch it. But for polio and smallpox, this was horrifying. My dad had polio with his throat. He was out of high school for a year, as I probably told you. My uh, grandmother, polio of the legs, people were paralyzed. Your children would play with other children. God forbid they got polio, they're paralyzed for life. It was a terrifying thing for parents until they got this nice vaccine for it. All right? But for these kind of things, <clears throat> we just do over the counter. Uh, we treat the symptoms of the cold. Now, while we have all this virus stuff on the board, Get this out of the way. The flu changes yearly. Housed when people have immunity in, let's say, like birds. 
migratory geese. In the 1950s, they wanted to get rid of the bad flus. And they would say, okay, let's test all the animals on the planet and figure out where the few have the flu is hiding. Because when everybody's got immunity, it doesn't reproduce in people, but it still seems to be on the planet. Where's it going? And they checked everything, and it's in migratory geese. And they're not going to murder every geese, goose, goose. They're not going to murder all these flying birds. So they learned something. So they basically, the world's changing in terms of who's rich and who's poor. But at one point in Asia, people lived close to their fowl. They lived close to their birds, and if you drank the same water and the birds are going to bath them in, there could be more of some cross-contamination and more of a chance for the virus to make the species jump. So, for the flu, each year, the scientist, and I say this one, bets on a horse. What would that even mean? They look over in Asia early in the year and they say, which one of these new flu viruses looks like the strongest that it's going to make it to America? And when we figure out which one it is, that'll be the horse we bet on for the derby, okay? And then they make a flu vaccine for it. So they match a vaccine for this. And they give everybody the vaccine that it comes out, it's in your pharmacy, you get a vaccine for the flu. And sometimes in some years they bet on the wrong horse and they say the vaccine is not very effective. We thought a different virus was gonna make it to America because we had to find these viruses. It's a hard thing to do, okay? Finally, you've got your COVID story. Might as well get that out of the way. So with COVID, it mutates. And we normally would not try a vaccine. Like we don't try for the common cold. We normally would say, you know, it's going it's to mutate too much. It's too expensive. It's not like smallpox or polio. We can get rid of that on this planet. If we ever have a chance to get rid of it, some countries don't want us to do it. But, well, they don't want us to give their babies the polio vaccine on the tongue. And whenever you get to some parts of the world, the people will say this is, you know, because, you know, the, the vaccine is strapped on the baby's tongue. But if any of them feel sick from the vaccine, the people are going to say, you just hurt the kid. That's not something I wanted, okay? That's, that's exactly how they'll say it. But they were actually, like, killing some of the people who were administering the vaccine. So some parts of I won't say what part of the world, but it's uh, pretty close to Afghanistan. There was like some real issues with trying to get the vaccine out. And some Bill Gates was trying to do. Anyway, uh, like, so we never got rid of polio for the planet. We thought we could eradicate it finally. So we don't try for the common cold because why should we make a vaccine for something that's not going to kill us? And we, you know, we would have to be chasing it constantly. But COVID is dangerous enough. We have to do something. So we do the vaccine. <laughs> but it's gonna continually need new vaccines all the time. So this is, I don't know how you're ever gonna stop this cycle. It's not like once you get the vaccine for some of the mumps, measles, rubella vaccine, you have this long-term uh, immunity to it. Um, this, this, every time this thing changes, it's going to find ways of getting around the antibodies that your body learned from the vaccine time. Got some major issues and how they do it, but that's what you need to know. So to make a long story short, let's say you just get the common cold. If you get the common cold, we treat the symptoms. 
So get common cold or flu and we treat symptoms. Just try to make the process not as bad for you. And the symptoms are important. Your body's trying to do stuff. Now, to block the cold virus, your body produces histamines. Now, this doesn't actually block the replication of the virus at all, but it makes it harder for the virus to get into the body. How would that work? Causes your eyes to swell. Congestion. Cough. Sneezing. Your body tries to sneeze out the virus. Your body tries to cough out the virus. Your body tries to put a bunch of congestion so the virus can't get in. Your body swells your eyes and makes them itchy so you keep them closed, so you don't get. All of the, the histamine is just basically telling your body, shut itself off any way it possibly can. But this is annoying, okay? People don't like this. So the first anti-cold drug or common cold drug you would want to be taking is the antihistamine. If you live in Kentucky, if you're watching this in Kentucky, um, the largest per capita use of antihistamines in the country, because for some reason the allergies are quite bad here. If you're not from here and you're not exposed to these allergens, you might say this is a wonderful place. And people say, if you live here 10 years, you're going to get allergies. I lived for 10 years and all of a sudden I had allergies. So your body can only take the allergen so long before it says, you know, I'm going to fight this. But for those first 10 years, I was like, why are these people all taking, what do you take? You're taking antihistamines, you're taking Allegra, you're taking Claritin, you're taking, um, I guess, Coracetin, uh, you're taking, well, not Coracetin, but uh, you're taking, um, I can't think of the name of the, that drug, but it's an older one we used to take, but just Benadryl. Okay, you're taking Benadryl and you're taking them every day of your life. Ah, eh, you gotta live with it. But you're blocking the histamine so you don't get those symptoms as much. You're still gonna get your common gold. So anyway, you take your antihistamines. They, of course, block histamines. And make you sleep. It's just like any biochemical reaction. You might find something that's going to do one thing and do something else at the same time. It's going to block histamines, but it also triggers sleep in people. People don't often want to be triggered to sleep. For example, Benadryl, the oldest one, the pink pill, or one of the older ones. Every night in the hospital, the nurses go around and they give one Benadryl to every single patient. The patient always says, but I don't have an allergy. And they say, don't worry about it. The nurses want to be left alone. They want you to sleep. It's going to put the person to sleep if they're not used to Benadryl. It's quite strong. I'm surprised um, how much it makes some people sleepy. So now, well, you don't want to be sleepy. So daytime cold medicine? You'd be surprised. What if you did Benadryl and caffeine? They make preps where you're feeling like you, you feel like this uh, tingling in your body because I'm really tired but I keep finding myself waking up. So you can manage it if you're managing these drugs. But either way, the antihistamines are pretty important. There are other things they add in these preps, we say. So, first we had the antihistamine. Then, 
Then after the antihistamine, there'd be two, the cough suppressant. I can't spell ESS. Ah. Your ESSANT, perhaps. Cough suppressant. Now, that's important, especially for children sometimes. If a child is coughing constantly, they can like hurt their rib cage really badly. The expression people use is you're going to break a rib, for God's sake, you're coughing so much. But your body's trying to cough out something. Right? Now, even narcotics are used. Like if you go to a doctor because you're coughing so badly, they give you a coating. <laughs> you probably won't cough, but you got to be careful. You're taking a narcotic. We'll talk about narcotics. So even narcotics are used. But a lot of times you want to get stuff out of you. So you could buy a cough of uh, 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 one of these preps for the common cold. That's cough suppression. Or I don't think they're mixed together. You could buy an expectorant. Now, this makes you cough up material. I should write phlegm, but I can't spell it. But it makes you cough up material. You probably wouldn't get a cough suppressant adding something to make you cough up material. But let's say your lungs are filled and you're not coughing constantly, but you'd like to get rid of the stuff that's clogging up your lungs and making it hard to breathe. Then you would take the expectorant. So you're always trying to fix these things. Uh, let's see. Obviously, rest, fluids, electrolytes. You don't want to not be hydrated. Chicken soup, you want to be able to, because why is chicken soup? It's light on you, but it's also got the proteins, it's got, it's got the carbs. Uh, a little bit of carbs for the noodles, and it's got um, the fat. If it's got some fat on it, you could live on the macronutrients and just try to get better on your own. All right. But anyway, there's your common cold drugs, and they mix this stuff together. They often put a pain reliever inside of there too. So all of these are probably going to have some Tylenol in them. But if you were to buy, um, let's see if I have thing on me. I never know what I have on me. But I do live in Kentucky. So this is uh, effervescent tablets for cold relief. So it's basically set up on the premise of uh, Alka-Seltzer, okay? Active ingredient, okay? 325 milligrams of aspirin. It's two of these in this Alka-Seltzer. So an Alka-Seltzer normally has a bicarbonate to make the bubbles so that you don't have the acid reflux. You don't want to have acid reflux. So much of your life, you have sinus prep drainage down your throat, which causes acid reflux and you could have long-term effects. If you're constantly having sinus drainage and you live in Kentucky, you have to treat your allergies or you're going to have a very bad life, but it's very dangerous to have acid reflux all the time. You'd be surprised. So this has two aspirins in it. Most people would say, we'll get the one with Tylenol, but I'm kind of afraid of Tylenol, so much more dangerous. There's the other one, chlorophenamine uh, malate. Okay, I forgot what the name of that over the counter is, but that's two milligrams. So now we've got aspirin, we've got a buffer, we've got chlorophenamine malate, which is going to be the um, antihistamine, and then it's got phenophrine bitartrate. So then it's got the decongestant. Now, the one that you can't get unless you give them your license is Sudafed. But the fake Sudafed, the over-the-counter stuff that you can't make the meth from or whatever you want to make from it is phenophene bitartrate, et cetera. And often these things will often have like dextromethorphan in them too. And the dextromethorphan is something that kids abuse. But you put all these preps together, you'd be surprised how many things you treat. It's an amazing drug. All right. You just got to like, the older you get, the more you got to treat stuff. Just don't overdo anything. All right. So if you get a cold or flu virus, you 
don't get antibiotics. You ask your doctor, you beg your doctor, in some countries antibiotics are over the counter, but you don't get antibiotics because they say it's the flu virus, it's not gonna work. But eight days later, and you are still sick. Well, most of the time, eight days later, you're not sick with the virus anymore. You just have, you might have HAVE, a secondary bacterial infection. So that could be like strep or bronchitis. So you've gotten a cold, you've weakened yourself, you've got the secondary bacterial infection, and suddenly the doctor gives you antibiotics. And you tell the doctor or you tell your friends, you know, I at first they wouldn't give it. I wish they had given it to me originally. Originally, you just had the cold and it wouldn't have worked on it in their minds. But then they give the antibiotics when they really feel you need it. And why do they worry about that? Well, we'll talk about the antibiotics now. Like if you wonder, people my age, 56 year olds, or at least 56 year olds used to be. How do we work every day? How do we get up at 8 a.m.? Half the time, the average college student is sick for two weeks, and they're like, oh my God, and you are sick for two weeks, okay? You're stressed, but also you don't know how to manage your health problems, okay? You really just gotta be proactive for a lot of stuff. You don't wanna let get stuff get really bad. So we have just gotten really good at knowing our bodies. Like I said in some of my previous discussions, you become an expert in your body. You figure out what you can eat, what you can't eat, and you limit the amount of um, your ability to be very sick. Because you might be someone, like my sister's a pharmacist. Her husband's a pharmacist. Two of her children are pharmacists. She's made all of her kids pharmacists. Um, these people, they have to work. She works like 80 hours a week in a hospital or cancer ward in New Jersey, for God's sake. She runs some of the COVID trials. But to make a long story short, she can't take off. So it sounds incredible to a young students like, what do you mean? I might be sick for a week. You have so many friends who are sick for a week. The older you get, the more successful, the more you just keep working and you learn to deal with drugs and figure out what's good for you and what's, just don't overdo anything. So for the antibiotics, classic one is penicillin. You have your tetracyclines. You have, um, I guess, erythromycin. But these aren't what you call these things. You probably call penicillin penicillin. But um, like here, you probably say suflexin. Suflexin, so K-flex, they might call it. They say it's a fish antibiotic, but either way, people take K-flex. They'll say this antibiotic works on skin. This antibiotic works on lungs. This one works on strep. This one works on gram positive. This one works on gram negative. These are terms that people use. So it depends if they can match which particular bacteria you have. Um, you might have heard of Cipro. Or let's say you have K-Flex, a drug that's going to work on a certain um, species of bacteria, but the bacteria has a way of getting around it. If you add something to K-Flex, so you add something that stops bacteria from getting around the K-flex. So they put two things together, that's called augmentum. Most of the time they give you augmentum, if you're wondering. But in the past they gave you all kinds of stuff. Now, what does a pharmacist, what does a doctor tell you about these? If they give you this, 
you must finish the prescription. And lately, they've been trying to get it like a fast uh, Z pack kind of a thing, so you take them all. Okay, you must finish the prescription. And you gotta wonder the way people, you know, less and less people seem to be, uh, you know, thinking about other people. I think with social media, you think more about yourself most of the time. A lot of people might be like, you know, something. If I feel sick, I'm not going to finish the prescription. Why would you feel sick? Some people's stomachs, you mess up the biota of your stomach. So let's go into that. <laughs> let's say this is your 100% bacteria level when sick. Now, it's not a virus, this is your secondary bacterial infection, or maybe you got a straight up bacterial infection. So, to make a long story short, you have this 100% bacteria level. You take your antibiotics and you knock out this much of it. Even lower, you knock out that much of it, let's say. This is still here. And if you finish the prescription, this can be taken out. But your stomach hurts. Bacteria is important to your stomach. You changed the flora, F-L-O-R-A. You changed the bacterial levels in your stomach to now you have stomach pains. And you say to yourself, I know this augmentum is changing the bacterial level in my stomach and I feel fine. I've gotten a lot of relief. So you decide to stop taking the antibiotic. But you still have this. Now here's where it gets confusing. Doctors rely on you worry about getting sick again, but it may not be exactly true. But here's the truth. If you stop early, you probably have enough natural immunity Because your immune system hasn't been doing nothing this entire time, it's been trying to pull the bacteria out of your body, you probably have enough, enough immunity to be fine. But if they say that, you're like, well, then why the heck am I finishing it? My stomach hurts really bad. But the bacteria that is left is the strongest against the antibiotic. This bacteria you have left has proven itself to be the strongest against the antibiotic. Now you're going to be fine because you've got its code. You're going to get rid of it. But when you spread this bacteria, you might spread antibiotic resistant bacteria to someone else. So when they tell you to finish it, they're hoping you care enough about your fellow man not to spread a virus, not a virus, but a vicious version of bacteria. And you might just be, well, I only care about myself and for God's sakes, I'm not gonna have a stomach ache. It's annoying as can be, and I'm not gonna finish this. That's why we try to have a shorter and shorter uh, plan so that you take it fast. Because if we go the full seven days carefully, a lot of times people don't finish it. That's why there's so many bottles of antibiotics left over in people's houses. So uh, a moral thing for the rest of the country, the rest of the planet is you should probably, you should finish these things. 
unless you're completely in that much pain in your stomach, because if you spread a bacteria, because the next person has no immunity to it. If you, you, you have a way to get rid of the rest of it, but you might spread some of the really strong bacteria to a person with no immunity, and then they have a much worse effect. So that's that secondary bacterial infection. And that's why the doctors want you to finish your antibiotics. Yay. Still doing good on time. <sighs> Back when I did 50 minute lectures and then I take a break. Is that how that works? And I started at 22. So I tell you what, this is a good place to break for a moment in your drug discussion. We're going to continue doing the drug discussion. <laughs> I continue doing drugs, we'll continue doing the drug discussion. You should ask your doctor for stuff. Don't take my word on anything. 